right? So this is Introduction to Java with me, Simmer Beer, Sing Gil. Let me just really quickly. Okay. So what we're going to go over today is we're going to start with the history of Java, what the programming language started as, and what the principles were as we go into then its pros and cons, where it's being used today, and then we're going to go a lot into syntax and structure and general concepts with the language. So if you have any questions, um, uh, you could just ask, or I don't know if you could unmute, but you can ask in the chat as always, and I'll be checking routinely. And so, yeah, I'll just go ahead and get into it. So some of the key history behind Java. Uh, in 1991, James Gosling, among others, but James Gosling is considered to be the like father of the programming language. Uh, they were working with Sun Microsystems, which was a pretty big um, tech company at the time. And they were working on this Oak language. And so he was with Sun Microsystems for around 26 years and uh, originally began with Unix windowing systems, et cetera. And he, along with engineers such as Patrick Naughton, they were frustrated with their C++ and C pro APIs and other tools. And so they wanted to design Java with a C or C++ style syntax um, that they would find familiar for other programmers and application programmers, but they wanted to make it simpler and run more effectively as well. So in um, 1995, that's when we get the Java development kit alpha and beta. And when Java was first being developed, it was mainly going to be for embedded systems, which like electronic appliances. Today, you see it with Blu-ray disc readers, for example. And then it sort of evolved into what we know Java as today being such a massive programming language. So in 1996, Sun Microsystems releases the first public implementation of Java Development Kit 1.0, which is going to be the first history or the first version that you'll see. Then in 2002, when they released J2SE, then um, the Java community process is going to take control of how Java evolves as a language. And so in 1998, the Java community process was created to allow parties to develop standard technical specifications for Java technology. So uh, different partners and whatever would become members of the Java community process, and they would use Java specification requests, which formal documents in order to like give what they want for the technology and that was mainly governing it for a long period of time then in november 2006 sun microsystems released the jvm uh java virtual machine as free and open source software so this is basically just it's um <clears throat> uh virtualization or emulation compiling uh software and for it to be free and open source software that means that anyone can use it, copy, whatever. It's freely licensed to everyone. And the source code is openly shared so you can improve the design or whatever you want it to do. And Java for a long time was built on proprietary software where it was um, under strict copyright licensing. And that's mainly how Sun Microsystems made a lot of profits off of it in earlier times. And so in 2009, Oracle is the one that acquires Sun Microsystems and now they're the main hand in Java's evolution. Now, as we look into version history, Java's undergone a lot of different versions. It started with, of course, JDK beta and then 1.0. Over time with J2SC 1.2, we see the just-in-time compiler, which really just improved the compiler. It allows the computer code to um, compile as it's executing, and it's going to make it run better than what they used before, which is where it would run before. Then we see around 2002 with j2sc 1.4 jcp is going to govern the additions and changes and then we go to j2sc 5.0 they add a lot of new features and new classes which we'll all get into there and those are just some of the main things that some of those updates provided so where to code java there's a couple different options you could go to oracle's website in jdk.java.net and you could actually get the developer kit itself and if you have just a standard notebook app like textpad up there which is what i use for school 
then that is going to allow you to code. You just have to set it up, but there's videos online that'll help you out with that. And you could also use integrated development environments or IDEs. Um, they provide an integrated development environment that allows for functionality for other languages, but in Java, it's really keen. It'll have a code editor, compiler, debugger, interpreter. So Eclipse is one that I use at home because I don't have a Windows computer, but it's pretty key to like allowing me to actually do projects and whatever at home. And I can understand everything because it shows me what code is incorrect, where the problems are, and it'll compile all well. And so that is mainly where you are able to code with Java. Now some pros versus cons. Um, Java security, Java is one of the more secure languages for programming. It's actually one of the most secure and um, it has a security manager, which uh, is created so that each application can, you could specify access rules. So this allows you to run the Java applications in a sandbox. And we're gonna see that with keywords like public, private accessor specifiers they're called. And um, Java also has OOP design, which is object-oriented programming. And we'll get into this a lot in a little bit, but um, before it was mainly procedural programming where you just have a sequence, like a linear one program for everything. And object-oriented programming, you can group variables and functions by context under different lenses as objects, and it allows it to run a lot smoother. And Java is also a high-level language, so Java, it resembles human language. The syntax and everything, it's very easy to understand. And so instead of resembling machine code, like low level languages, high level languages, they are converted through compilers, but like it simplifies the development process. It makes it easier for you to understand. And it's not going to require as much commenting or anything because everything will be right there. It'll be pretty clear to understand with how close it is to human language. So. Um, <clears throat> also has automatic memory management. Uh, Java developers, they don't have to worry about manually writing code for memory management tasks due to this automatic memory management and garbage collection system. And so a program is effective based on its memory and memory is limited. So with using languages with manual management, developers risk forgetting to allocate memory and but with Java, you have a garbage collector to locate objects no longer referenced and remove them. And automatic memory management is going to make it a lot easier for you to actually allocate that memory, which will make your programs more effective. And write once, run anywhere. That's Java being spread out across multiple different platforms. You can use several different platforms like Linux or Mac OS. You can use... <coughs> Um, Windows as well. So Java is one of the more widespread languages that you can use for that sort of thing. And now into the cons, uh, poor performance issues. Uh, any high level language is going to have poor performance issues due to just compilation and abstraction with the level of a virtual machine. Uh, but it's not the only reason for Java's speed often being criticized. They have the garbage collector will take up more than 20% of the CPU time and there's bad caching configuration, uh, the use of excessive memory. So Java is gonna have a lot of out of memory errors and several other different errors that will lead to this poor performance at times. Now, verbose code, verbose code just means that it uses too many words. And it might seem like an advantage if you want to understand the code. Like we said earlier, it was a high level language with human language similarities, but there's often long overcomplicated sentences or overcomplicated methods and classes that make the code less readable. And many high level languages tend to do a bit too much. So Java was trying to tone down C++ and how confusing it was, but it still is relatively verbose. Now we were talking about this as well, but <clears throat> um, Java requires a lot of memory. So Java, even though it has a garbage collector and it has automatic memory management, like dealing with all sorts of things, the memory required is still substantial compared to a lot more other programming languages. And that's going to be pretty bad for Java as it is. No backup facility just means that it's um, pretty hard for the code to actually be 
backed up once written because there is no backup facility. Other programming languages offer it, but Java doesn't really have that. And then a poor GUI. Um, Java is considerably backwards with its GUI because the GUI builder is pretty poor and it can't build too much complex UI. So there are many frameworks in Java for creating UI, but they are not as developed as you will see with languages like C Sharp or Python or R. And so those are some of the cons that we see with Java as a language. Now, if we're going to look at uses of Java today, one of the primary ones is game development. Uh, so for example, libgdx, it's a free open source game development application written in Java with some C, C++ components. And it allows for you to develop mobile games and uh, desktop games with the same code base across different platforms. And Java is also pretty key to learning game development and graphics from the ground up as compared to languages like you might see C Sharp. Uh, trading applications, you have Murex, which is used for trading, hedging, funding, risk management, a lot of finance related things in the banking industry, especially. And um, their mission statement says that they focus on the long term. They forge lasting strategic partnerships and clients as they embark on transformational IT journeys, achieve regulatory readiness and evolve digitally. So that's one of the main examples that it's used because Murex is pretty popular. Then big data and having open source framework in general. The example here is the Apache Hadoop project, which develops open source software for reliable distributed computing. And this software library allows for distributing large data sets across many different computers. And like big data in general often does use Java. It's one of the most primarily used languages along with Python. So that's one of the main areas. and just Hadoop in general, not Apache Hadoop, is sort of the same thing there. Then going into more uses, uh, embedded systems, as we were talking about earlier, embedded systems are just low level systems, part of larger electromechanical systems. So tiny chips, processors, example, there's the Blu-ray disc reader, also SIM cards, they're all Java based, and that's one area you could apply that. Now, scientific tools, if you don't know, that is the logo for MATLAB, which includes the Java virtual machine software. So you can create and run programs to access Java objects with MATLAB, and MATLAB is going to allow for plotting functions, etc. It's very useful in the <clears throat> higher math realm. And uh, then mobile applications and enterprise applications. Uh, one of the big ones is J2ME. It's a cross-platform framework that will build mobile applications to run across Java-supported smartphones and feature phones. You also have the Java-based Android SDK. And Java, for developing enterprise programs, it has a lot of powerful people features with its high performance. So Java makes applications more powerful, secure, scalable. And that's why Java's Enterprise Edition uh, is primarily used by a lot of enterprise computers. According to Oracle, almost 97% of enterprise computers are running on Java. And so those are areas that you could see yourself potentially using Java. Now, Java's features, Java was built on these 12 principles on this image. So just to go over some of them, simple syntax based off C++ with its garbage collection, we've all mentioned that. Security, since it's highly secure with that Java virtual machine. <clears throat> um, uh, write once, run anywhere, since it can run on a variety of different platforms. It just converts into bytecode, which is how Java is mainly working converts it into bytecode and runs it across different platforms. There's a fixed size of the primitive type data, which makes it pretty um, robust. And portability, Java's bytecode does not need to be implemented. So that goes tying into the platform independence. And uh, it's pretty dynamic with the loading of classes being on demand. It's relatively quick. And that relates back to speed. So little. So just some basic syntax with this uh, example right here. We see public class main, and we see this method header. This is called method header, public static void main string bracket bracket args. And this method header is what you're going to use in any class that you're trying to run. So 
you're going to need this in order to have the program actually run. It'll be used when you have multiple, you have driver classes later on, or if you're learning procedural programming, this is your absolute main method. So the public keyword means that everything's accessible to other classes and clients that are using our program. Public class main, the class we're going to talk about in a sec, but the class is the big thing that encapsulates everything. And your class name needs to always be capitalized. And then this main method, everything is encased in curly brackets. That's indented um, by programmers in order to show how everything works. So inside of the class is this main method, which inside of the method is this print statement. So we see the print statement, hello world, pretty famous uh, computing phrase. You system.out.println, we'll just print it and then indent to the next line. You could do print just by itself to print on the same line. And with this, Java is allowing you to display it, um, display anything inside the print statement, which can be used with variables later. And it has to be in this exact syntax where system.out.println, because system is a class, you are using method from a class, and you always need a semicolon after any method call. This is called a method call. So if you have the S, oops. If you have the S lowercase, it won't work. If you're creating a variable integer, you don't have the semicolon, it's not gonna work. And public static void main, you have to have public lowercase. It has to be like this with the curlies and everything. That's how the compiler reads the syntax and that's how it all works. Now, why is public lowercase? Well, Java has a lot of keywords which are predefined and reserved words used in Java programming, which have special meanings to the computer. You're not able to name any class method or variable after any of these keywords. So uh, some of the examples here with keywords that we see are class, as we saw before, default, which is used in something called a switch statement. Uh, you have floats, which are like integers, if, for, interface, private, public, your access specifiers, uh, super switch, uh, and all of that is going to be how the computer is able to tell, what is this trying to say to me? Is this class able to be accessed by multiple people and other classes and clients, or do I need to keep it restricted? And that sort of thing. So data types, there's two data types, primitive and object types, or they're also called non-primitive types, but uh, primitive data that specifies the specific value and state. So there are no methods. You have integers, characters, or chars, doubles, booleans, et cetera, and they're gonna occupy what's called stack memory location. And so examples of method, uh, initializing variables, integer var equals one with the semicolon for the proper syntax. And anytime you use a character, you need apostrophes around it. And then object types, they refer to user created objects. They occupy uh, addresses in stack memory, but then in heap memory is the references. And you'd learn more about those as you get into data structures and algorithms and you get more advanced with Java. So examples include strings right here, string name equals Simmerbeer with the semicolon. You're gonna always wanna use double quotes and wrapper objects, which is a way for you to use primitive data types and put it into an object form, which will be used later on for other purposes. So this is a project that I did like three years ago in my very simple beginning class of just printing. So I create three integer test variables, just test scores, and my name. Integer sum is adding up all the scores. The average is going to be the sum variable, which takes these variables, adds them together. So the sum variable divided by three. Now, it would be cast to a double, but we'll talk about that. And I was tasked to not use println. So you see all these slash ends. Those are escape characters that you just use inside of a print statement um, in the between double quotes. So new line is slash n, slash t is tab, and et cetera. And so this is the example of how it prints. If I use the variable here, it's going to print what the actual variable it has stored to it. So my name is printed with test one. It prints the test one score and same for test two and three. Total points, 291, because it adds them all together. And the average, it divides it 97.0, but this was uh, 
pretty sure it was a mistake because this would be cast to a double. So commenting as well, good coding practice in general, not just with Java, but we'll go over that it just, in Java, this is a single line comment, just two slashes. And if you want multiple lines, a slash and then an asterisk, and then you reverse the order to close it. Um, so commenting explains what certain data structures, algorithms, methods, etc., are going to do. And you could do it in the Java doc style comment where you add an extra asterisk here. And that's going to allow for the understanding of preconditions and post conditions. <clears throat> so Java doc comments, they are like the de facto industry standard when you document Java classes. So that's why it's really good to have a knowledge of commenting and what your code is going to do. And you can also use this for pseudocode purposes where pseudocode is plain language description of the steps of an algorithm so that it's easier to understand. It's just for human reading and not for machine reading. So for example, if you see on the AP exams for AP Computer Science A, for example, that will have plain language descriptions. So that is examples of pseudocode. Um, Now, operations is pretty standard, especially just relating to other languages, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulo, where it just takes the remainder. So for example, if you divide 11 by three, you'd have 11 over three, which would be nine over three plus two over three. So you have the leftover remainder of two. It's always going to print that, but it's for integers only. And then casting is how you make it so that a variable is uh, automatically pushed to a different type. So C2.1 is a double, which stores decimal values. But if I cast it to be an integer, it'll just be two. And if I cast an integer five to be double, it'll be 5.0. So if we look at this on the right really quickly, uh, it prints three, then double the equal 7.3, so it print 7.3. Uh, it casts i to a double, so this is going to print 3.0. This one casts d to an integer, so it just prints seven. i times equals four, so that um, structure with operations just means i is equal to i times four, or just multiply i by four. You could do that as well for plus equals, minus equals, etc. cetera. So um, i, if you multiply by four, it's going to be 12 because it didn't save the other values. And d divide equals two. Um, since it's a double, it'll be whatever that value is going to be decimal wise. Now, this is a big feature of Java, object-oriented design. So it's one of the key principles. And the basis of Java is having classes, um, a program code template, which is used to create an object. So classes, they contain the objects, and objects allow for instances of larger classes. So the class is kind of like the model. It's what is the specific thing, and the object is if you create an instance of that class. You create an example of it. So for example, you could have a class about a car. And if this car, you have different attributes and behaviors, that's what an object has. So attributes are instance variables or global variables. Behaviors are methods. So if you have this car class, a car, for example, has its vehicle identification number. It has its brand mileage and these are all examples of what you would include as instance variables and so if you were to create an instance of a car then you take the car class you take everything within it you create an object that is going to be um a singular piece of that car it's a specific type of car let's say it's a uh hyundai santa fe for example that's what you could create using a class so an object just an example of a class. The class is the big, the big like template, but it creates, you create an object using the class. And I'll show that too. Uh, but first Java has features of built-in classes. So there's a lot of different packages in Java and in these packages, um, <clears throat> It just groups related classes, uh, like built-in packages are in the Java API. So it's basically like a folder. And what you're going to see with these packages is 
for example, you have the Lang package, util, AWT, and they contain different classes constructed with a development kit, and they require a keyword to use. And um, you have the package before the class in any program. You're going to import it. And you can use the built-in classes within any that you are going to create as the user, as the programmer. So some examples would be system.out.print. It's included in Java index of and dot length or string class methods, um, array list class. It's going to feature methods like dot size, dot add, dot set. Um, <clears throat> uh, the scanner class allows for keyboard input from the user uh, and then math class. The math class is going to allow you to do several different mathematical operations, uh, such as rounding, for example, is one key feature that it can do. And that's also finding maximum minimum values. It's very key, especially when you're learning Java at first. So going to object-oriented program, now we have the constructor. So this is different from a method or function, as a function is called in Python, but the constructor is different from that. Um, this is used to create instances of a class that, when called, will initialize an object. The default constructor is always going to be created by the Java compiler. And if it has parameters, you're going to use the instance and global variables. Global variables are just accessible throughout the entire class. And for most purposes, you want to use private access specifier for your instance variables, because if you have a class, you don't want someone just going in and changing everything up to what you intend it to be. If you have a car class, you don't want someone to change what parts of a car there are to be something that does a car does not include, for example. So. This example I have here that I wrote up, it features a default constructor and a um, custom constructor, which is the one with the parameters, the variables inside of the parentheses. So there are rules when you define a constructor. The name has to be the same as the class name. And the class name and constructor name have to always be capitalized. And it can't have a specific return type, which we'll get into in a little. But you see how it's just public dog. You just want it to always just be public class name. Uh, and so we go into looking at this constructor, string name, uh, int age, and double weight. These are all attributes that a dog has. And so when I have these constructors, if I create an object of a dog, then it's going to use these constructors in order to create that object. So I have dog right here. This is the default constructor. If someone creates it and they don't put any variables in these parentheses, then it's going to make a dog named Cooper, who's eight years old and the weighs 60.5 pounds. But if I give a specific name, age, and weight, then it is going to assign it to these values. And you could display that so you might see also this this keyword the this keyword is just to differentiate between the instance variable and local variable so i just wanted to show that because in here these are local variables that can only be used in the constructor but um uh the this keyword makes sure that the computer knows i want to address that these instance variables up here get changed to be the values of these local variables and so on the next slide is examples of objects being initialized. So this is the basic form of how you are going to create an object. The class name, or yeah, the class name, just any name you want. There are naming conventions, but um, you just can't really have a number in front. You can't have certain characters, mostly just mainly alphanumeric. Um, equals new dog with parentheses semicolon for the same syntax. And then creating a second one, you always want to have new dog. And here I have a string Samson, an integer three, and weight 49.75. <coughs> and with that, if I go back here, with the first dog, it has nothing in its parentheses, so no parameters. So it's going to create a dog named Cooper who's eight years old and weighs 60.5 pounds. Dog two, I give it a specific string name. I give it a specific age and weight, and it has to be in the order that you put it in the actual constructor code. So it's going to assign it a dog who's named Samson, three years old, and weighs 49.75 pounds. So that's how constructors work. 
then we get into methods or the behaviors of an object. And these are called functions in Python and I think C. And they're used to allow for reusability of code. It allows large segments of code to be run by one simple method call. And some are built into object classes. So if we look at method declaration right here, the access specifier, public or private, just who can access it. The return type, this, if you have a return type, that means that you're going to have to use the return keyword inside the method and you have to return whatever variable or call, um, object type that is. So this would have to return a number, an integer. Then the method name following same naming conventions, this is what you're going to call. And then your method signature, you call the method signature. Uh, the parameter list, just variables that you are going to send to the method. So if I call sum one, two, I'm going to send the numbers one and two inside of the method. It's going to add them up. And so that's your basic method header. Some examples, a void method has no return type. It's often used to just output something. Say you want to output something that you loop through to print or a mutator method, which just basically changes a variable or changes an object, changes an attribute of an object. That's what a void method does mainly. And then return types um, used with multiple classes as accessor methods to access certain values um, from one class in a different class, or they're called getter methods. And so if I take a private Boolean verify in a class and I want to get that from another class, then I have get verify as my method. It'll return the verify variables value. And that's how I'm able to get the value from a different class with instance variables being private instead of letting it be public and letting someone change it. Now, just examples, we have a print uppercase that has a parameter string s. So it's gonna print s dot to uppercase, which is a string method that makes every letter in the string sentence uh, uppercase letters. So if I'm calling inside the print helper class, then I can just do the method signature as it is, print uppercase and send my string value to the method. To call it from another class, I'd have to create a print helper object. Uh, and then I have to put the object name dot the method. So anytime you're using it externally, you're going to have to use dot the method with whatever you're trying to send from the object itself, because you're asking the computer to do the method on that specific object since you can't access it otherwise. <clears throat> string methods, strings are an object type variable with several characters encased in double quotes. So uh, we have length, which returns the length, the substring, it's going to return a portion of the string from one index to another. It's the start of it is inclusive, but the end it's non-inclusive. And I'll say what that means in a sec. So index of string, you just return the numerical position of a character where a string starts. So uh, system.out.print the length, this is gonna output 14. The top is the length and the bottom is the indices, the numerical position of every letter. And indices always start with zero. You always start with zero in programming. And um, <coughs> um, so if we're gonna print the substring three to seven, it's asking the computer to print from the index three to index seven. So zero, one, two, three, uh, well at index three is this L four, five, six, seven. But since it's non-inclusive, that means you don't include the seventh index. So really you're just printing the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth index. So it's gonna print a low space E. It's gonna print those four characters. And then index of everyone, it's also looking for the index. So parentheses everyone. I'm going to have the sixth one right here. And um, it's going to see that everyone starts at the sixth index. So it would print the sixth index there. So again, indices always start at zero, but the length is always just the number of indices plus one. Um, and then substring again, just start at the index it's asking you to. And then basically you're printing every single index up to the last one minus one. Object methods are used with objects of besides strings, but as well as strings, and they're built into Java's library. Equals, dot equals, so you check if two strings or object are exactly the same in the reference. And compare to, you're gonna compare the objects, 
uh, to determine alphabetic location or whatever other criteria, which you can change with something called a comparable interface. Um, so with these two dogs I created earlier, does dog one equal dog two? If it, if it does, it would print yes. If it does not, it would print no. And we know that this dog is named Cooper, eight years old, 60.5 pounds. So they're not equivalent to each other because they don't have the same exact references. So it would print no. And that's the if else as well, which we'll get into in a bit. But uh, the subject here is computer science. The answer is dot compare to biology. So if you are comparing your subject if you are comparing something to something else, the first thing, if it is coming after it in the alphabet, it'll return a positive number. If it comes before in the alphabet, it'll return a negative number. And this all corresponds to the ASCII values in subtraction or addition, how far it is from each other. ASCII values just being the values of the characters. And subject compared to computer science, they're exactly the same. So it would just return zero. And um, this is an example with the comparable interface. An interface just basically says what methods you need to include inside of something. So <coughs> um, you create a student other and in, with this object temp. And if this is using student objects, create the student class on the side with name, grade, GPA. So create a student with custom constructor. It's going to have a name. Uh, he's going to have a year and going to have GPA then integrate well, to get the grade or whatever. So with this comparable interface, if I were to compare one student to another, I would be checking the grades instead of the names or the addresses or anything. So if one's grade is greater than another, it returns one number. If the opposite returns negative one, else it's going to return zero. And that's what you can do with a comparable interface. You can change the compare to method, change its return type or whatever, and that'll allow you more um, more accessibility and more personal say on what you want to compare. And we have two string as well, a very key one. It is a, creating a string representing the object that you will display with a call to the two string method. So in this dog class, we already know everything. And at the end, you'd create the two string method, which has the string return type since you're returning a string. And so this one is returning name, then it prints the name variable with a comma plus the age and plus years old. Don't have to put every instance variable inside of it. Um, all you need to do is just have some sort of string example that you can represent the object with in order to display it. And this is how a lot of different programs, like clients are going to display certain things, how mobile games display certain things on, this, on the boards and the screen. Now conditions. Um, Java has several conditions for Booleans. And um, uh, so we have equals equals. If you're going to use primitive data types, these are what you're going to use. Um, you could also use other methods with these, but that's a bit complex. Um, so equals equals, uh, you could use exclamation part or what we call not. So not equals greater than, less than, greater than, or equal to, and less than or equal to. So that table just shows you what that all wor works like. Then conditions will utilize Boolean operators above, and you're going to use if else statements. So if else statements are pretty simple. If you want something to be true, you're going to use if. Or if you want it to be false, you would use the not. But uh, so in general, if, use it if you want a condition to be true. Um, else, if you want something to be false if the if condition is true then it won't run the else but if you know that the if condition won't always be true you could have an else so that if it's false it'll run something else instead right if else that's pretty clear and else if is just to test a new sort of condition so here we have int a equals three and b equals three if a is greater than b it'll print a else if a is equal to b you have to use equals equals you can't use just one because that's the syntax. Then it prints x. And if both of those are not true, then everything's false. It prints b. Well, they're equal, so it would print x. And you could have in if statements nested inside other ones. So if this was true, if I wanted to test a different condition inside of it, I could do that as well. Uh, you also have and, 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 or, or. The pipes uh, or, or, and the ampersands are and, and. 
Uh, so this will test if multiple conditions are true. They have to both be true. But with or, it's just if one of them is true, then the thing will run. So with these three, four, and five, is A less than B? Yes. Is B less than C? Yes. So they're both true. OK, something will happen. Then here, same numbers. If A is less than B, or if B is greater than C, well, B is not greater than C, but A is less than B. And since it's the or operator, that's going to allow something to happen because only one of them needs to be true. If both were false, it wouldn't run. If just one of these is false with the and operator, it won't run. Uh, so this is just to determine the output. X equals 2, Y equals 3, Z equals 4. So is X less than Y? Yes. And is Y less than Z? Yes. So one would be true. Uh, is X less than Y? Yes. And is Y equal to 4? No, Y is equal to 3. So it can't print that because both are not true. Is X less than Y? Yes. But is Y equal to 4? No. But since it's the and or operator, excuse me, that means it is still able to run this because the condition is still true. It's only asking if one of those is true and X less than Y is a true condition. So it'll print three is true. Is X equal to Z? No. And then is Y not equal to three? No, Y is equal to three. Since both of these are false, it's not going to run because it needs at least one to be true. So things that print are one is true and three is true. Now loop structures, there's four for each do while and while. Uh, the general form for loops up here, so for initialization, typically encoding, you're going to create an i or a j variable. So integer i equals zero is what is created here. Then a condition. So here it asks if i is less than 10. And then an update, so i plus plus. So what the loop does is you take the initialized variable in this beginning one, you run the code, and then once the code is done executing, it increments it. Plus plus just means increase by one. So i is going to be equal to one. And then it runs the code again. Plus plus i is equal to two. Runs it over and over. When i is equal to nine, i is nine is less than 10. So it runs the code. Then it updates to be 10. And then 10 is less than 10. Well, that's not true because you need it to be exactly um, less than 10. And 10 is equal to 10. Since it's not less than or equal to, it can't run that time. So it stops running. So that's just for one line in general with if statements and for loops and other loops you could have. If you just have one line of code, you don't need to include curly brackets. But if you have multiple lines of code, then you would need to inc include curly brackets in order to encase all the code within the loop. And then while loops, just while and then a condition. It's going to run while the condition is true. Once the condition is false, then it stops running. And it's the same sort of thing where one code, one part of code, you don't need curlies. And if you have multiple lines of code within the loop, you do need curlies for the computer to compile it. Now, this is called an array. But for now, just think of it just if you don't know what an array is, just think of it as a list of numbers. So for integer n and then colon nums. So this list of numbers, I'm asking for every single singular integer within this array, within this list, I want you to print the number. That's how I think of it, because I used to have struggles with for each loops. But it's just simply for every number in this list, print every single number. So it prints the first, prints the second, prints the third, then it stops. Then do while. The do while automatically does the first thing. That's what the do keyword means. It's going to automatically do the first thing. And then. Um, it's going to run the code while, and then it checks if the condition is still true, it'll keep running. And then you could have four loops inside of each other. So here it's going to run the outer loop. Then it's going to run the inner loop for the full amount of time. So this is its first run of the outer loop. Then it runs the inner loop six times to print numbers. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. Then it prints to a new line because this code is done. Then it goes back up to here. It increments i equals 1. 1 is less than 2. So then it does this six times again. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 prints again. And um, then it prints to a new line. So if you have nested loops, then it's always outer loop is the amount of times you need to do the full runs of the inner loop. So 
you're going to run the inner loop as many times as it says all the time. And for example, if you have println, then this outer loop represents how many lines of code you are trying to print. And the inner loop represents what you are actually printing as an example. Array and array list. So arrays are sets of variables, both object or primitive, that are the same type declared in size and data type. So this is the syntax integer with brackets, nums equals new integer five. It's going to create an integer array of size five, which is this one right here, zero, 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 zero. An array list is a class that can be imported with its own methods, and it can only use object types. So the syntax for this is a bit more complicated. Array list, then you need these um, little things. I don't know what they're called, but uh, integer. That's the wrapper class it's called, as we were talking about earlier. That's a primitive data type in an object type so that an array list can use it. That's one of the key uses. And uh, list equals new array list integer because it is an object. So you do need to create it like that. And so if you're going to have it in a for loop, for an array, you're going to be accessing each different index, which remember starts at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, with these brackets and the name of it. So say you have, instead of nums, it was named list, then you would just access at the zeroth position, it's going to be equal to zero. At the first position, equal to one, because it keeps incrementing. Once it's nine, equal to nine, then it will stop. With an array list, you have to add. So let's look into that. Um, we'll look into that in a sec. Um, so this is an array of length six, but indexes start at zero. So the index is the position of each value and the indices start with zero for all of them. So if you have an array with array, the name array name, then zero is going to access this number right here because you're accessing it at this specific index, which accesses one. And then if you have list name dot get, that's one of the methods of an array list, then it will do the same for an array list. So it would get this if this was an array list. And one of the uses of an array list being using object types is you can actually store several of a unique object. Let's say we made a card class and you needed to store it in a cards list. Then you could use a for each loop for every, um, for every card in this list of cards. If it equals something, if it equals a guess of a card or whatever, then you could have something happen. So array list have to use objects for that purposes. That's why they're very useful, but there are pros and cons of both. Array lists are resizable with the dot add method, as you saw earlier, right here, it added it to the list because when you create an array list, it doesn't have anything. But when you create an array, it has to have a specific size or dot remove in order to remove things from the list. And arrays are not resizable. Array lists, you list name dot size, but then array name dot length is how you get the size of the array or array list to access an index, you have to use the dot get method. But here you just put the index in the brackets. They fill it with a loop for this, but you could fill this manually with declaration or with a loop. And this is only object types. This is primitive and object types. So if you want to change one value, you just access that specific index. You set it equal to something. So boom, at index zero, the original value was zero because when you declare an array, every value is zero. Then if I want to make it five, I just say at index zero, can you make the um, value of the array at index zero five? And then it'll do that. For array list, you have to use the dot set method. The first number being the index and the second number being the actual number you want to change it to. So at index zero, change it to five, set it to five, and then it will set it to five. There's also 2D arrays, which are like a matrix with rows and columns. So integer 2D array 2D. This is the syntax for it. You can't do a 2D array list, but you have a 2D array. So it takes two brackets. And the first number here is the rows. Second is the columns. So this is going to create three rows with five columns, like a matrix. It's in row major order. So in terms of indices, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 going this way, as well as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 going this way. So if I want to find 2D at row 1 and um, column 2, well, 0, 1, this is row 1, 0, 1, 2, this is column 2. So everything starts at 0, and that's just how you find the specific value. Because just imagine that these are also part of the array list. It's a 5, uh, it's a five by 5 array or 2d array and that's how i'm finding that value 
you navigate in row major order, you move down the rows, then you move right for the columns. Now going back into object-oriented design, this image features some more of its purposes. So encapsulation, just ha having related data and methods stored in the same class and using access specifiers like private to hide instance variables, protect them from unauthorized access. Um, so private with access on granted through public methods. And abstraction is having classes designated so that the user does not need to know how the public methods work, but simply what they do. Then you have inheritance, <clears throat> which I'll get into in a bit, and polymorphism, which actually I think inheritance is the next slide. Uh -huh. So inheritance, one class is going to inherit attributes and methods from another. So this is the idea of you create a class and then you extend it with a more specific class. So the super class, as we see in this picture, is an animals class. The super class is the class that features are going to be inherited from. So if I create a child class or a subclass that it's going to inherit features from another class or may create its own, well, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, those are all specific groups of animals, right? So superclass is the very generic, and then you take the more specific one. So let's say instead of a car class from earlier, I created an automobile class, then I want to create a subclass of that. I could create an SUV class, or I could create a sedan class, or something along those lines. So as you see here, the syntax, uh, this should not be capitalized. I apologize for that. Just it's, It should be lowercase public. Um, public class animal is the superclass. And public class horse extends animal is going to be the subclass. With inheritance and superclasses and subclasses, you have an is a sort of um, ordeal. If something is a something else, then you know that it is the subclass. So like a reptile is an animal. So that's how you know that the reptile is the subclass. Animal is the superclass. Or if you want to say like, um, you want to say like the India class is a country. So India would be the subclass. Uh, country would be the superclass. Um, so the subclass constructor has to have the same parameters uh, to start as your superclass constructor. And um, you can add more instance variables, but you don't have to have the instance variables from the superclass in the subclass as well, since it's extending, so it already inherits that. So here, class animal instance variable string type, uh, and then just string t is what you're going to have. This should say type equals t. And this should say for color equals F. So um, I could change that, I think, if I go here and just type equals T, because I don't want you to get the wrong idea of how for color. Um, OK, so what you're going to see here when you have your um, super class, you're going to have, or your subclass, you're going to have a new instance variable for color, like that's specific to a horse or whatever, I don't, or main color. Um, and then you have to have the same parameter as the animal class, but you can add your extra parameters as well. And so you use the super keyword in order to uh, access this, the constructor of the super class so that you can create the animal with this type, right? or whatever, uh, say like, you know, mammal, for example, and then horse, you just wanted to create very specific. And then for color or main color equals F, that's specific to the horse object. <clears throat> so polymorphism, polymorphism is when you use an object ref, the ability of an object reference to you be used as if it's referring to an object of different forms. So this is the result of inheritance. A dog extends a an animal, and then a chihuahua extends a dog. So you can create objects like animal a1 equals new chihuahua. Because a chihuahua is an animal, but an animal isn't necessarily a chihuahua. So on the left side, when you're creating these objects, you always want it to be less specific. On the right side, it has to be more specific if you're going to use polymorphism. So A1 is going to have access to animal methods unless overridden, which I'll talk about. It's the last slide. But 
um, it can only use Chihuahua specific methods if casted. So if I wanted to create a new Chihuahua C1, then I would have to cast A1 to be a Chihuahua. Um, and so with polymorphism, objects with a common superclass can be stored into the same data structure. And that's often why it's being used. You're storing it into an array list usually. So an array list animal, I can add a new animal, I can add a new dog, I can add a new chihuahua since they're all animals. But if it was an array list of chihuahuas, I couldn't add a new animal because an animal isn't necessarily a chihuahua. So it's kind of going back to that is a idea that you see with inheritance. And the last slide, overridden or overloaded. So <clears throat> we have in this first example, um, the same method with different return types it's going to give a compile error because even though the return type is different, the compiler considers the names. Those are not the same, or they are the same, excuse me. But here, the, uh, and the parameters are also the same. But here, same name, right? But the parameters are still the same. And it's going to cause a compiler error. It doesn't matter if they have different names. It's still an integer than a string. If you wanted it to not have an error, you would say method uh, integer than string, then you could have string and then integer. Then here you have set name, public void set name, sub subclass is going to have a set name method. So over um, writing, this is overloading when you have the same method signatures and whatever. Overloading or yeah, overriding over here is when you have a method in a subclass that is the same as one in a superclass. And the one in the subclass is going to be the one that takes preference because it overrides the method from the parent class. So that's how that works. And that's actually all of this presentation ending with glitching a little on my, okay. Uh, that's all for the presentation that I have actually. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. If it'll stop screen sharing.